Okay, everybody, once you're ready, we're going to pray. I'm still waiting. <laughs> Give thanks to you, our Heavenly Father, for Jesus, your dear Son, our Lord and Savior. We give thanks for keeping this through the night. We ask you, Lord, to continue to strengthen us. Have your spirit with us in this worship, this Bible study. May we be fed by your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, well, we're at Revelation 5, 11, I think. 5, 11. And I saw, so I heard a voice of an angel, angels of many around the throne, and the living one, also the elders. And he was the number of them. Myriad of myriads. And thousands of thousands. Saying with a voice great. Worthy is the lamb. Who has been slaughtered. To receive the power. And riches and wisdom. And strength and honor and glory. And thanksgiving. And every creature. One in heaven and upon the, the earth and under the earth and upon the sea, the one it is and the ones in them all are heard saying to the one sitting upon the throne and to the lamb, the blessing and the honor and the glory and the might into the eons of eons. And the four living ones, they were saying, Amen. And the elders, they fell down and they worshipped. Okay, that's uh, throne room scene. Let's uh, begin and uh, let's see. Dave, you want to take the, uh, the footnotes for a while? Yeah. Uh, 128, the praise radiates out from the four living creatures and the 24 elders to involve the innumerable host of angels around the throne in heaven. Their praise of the Lamb is again much more uh, effusive and extensive than anything that has preceded it. Uh, 129, in the ever-widening chorus of praise spreading out from the throne, it is the turn of all the creatures on earth, in the sky, and in the sea, to offer their praise to the Lamb, not omitting to direct their praise firstly to the one sitting on the throne. This is a timely reminder that the Creator is the first to be praised for the Lamb's redemption and that although uh, distinct in identity, uh, identity, they are united in dignity and purpose. 130. The new song of praise now returns to where it all bega began and concludes with an amen and prostrations from its initiators. It has got, it has not not gone unnoticed by various commentators that the form of prayer in Revelations 4, first to God, the Creator, and then to the Redeemer, parallels the form of the traditional morning and evening prayer, prayers in the synagogue. Doing from pre-Christian times, dating from pre-Christian times. This prayer starts with praise of God for his work of creation and concludes with praise for his acts of redemption. Uh, chapter 6, the Lamb executes the initial verdicts, six afflictions. Okay, my turn. 
Huh. And I saw one had opened the lamb, one from out of the seals. And I heard one from out of the four living ones saying a voice of thunder, you come. All right, Dave, we'll give you more to this one too. Uh, number 131. Having returned to the area of the throne, the St. John, the St. John's attention now focuses on the lamb as he proceeds to break the seven seals of the scroll one by one. What follows is the first of a series of seven events of a liturgical character to be followed by the series of seven trumpet blasts and then by the series of outpourings from seven uh, libation bowls. The breaking of each of the first four seals is the occasion for a specific mission from heaven to earth executed by a different horse and rider. The four single horses and their riders recall the first version in Zech Zechariah, but in every other aspect, their description alludes to Zechariah's later vision of four teams of horses and chariots called the four winds or spirits of heaven. Like these four winds of heaven, John sees the four houses and their riders leaving the presence of God in heaven to go out into the world. Uh, 132. Uh, a command is announced by each of the four living creatures in turn at the start of each of the four missions. There seems to be a close, the hierarchical, hierarch that's that's the I know I know what how to pronounce it, but it won't come out of my mouth. Okay. Yeah, hierarchical. Yeah. Uh connection between the four living creatures in heaven and the four horsemen setting out to cover the earth. As the main task of the four living creatures is to guard and sustain the the sovereignty of the creator over his creation, it would seem that the four horsemen perform a similar role on the earth, namely, to uphold the sovereignty of God over his creation. Six, two. And I saw, and you yourself behold, a horse white, and the one sitting upon him having a bowl. And he was given to, to him a crown, and he went out conquering, and so that he might conquer. And when he opened the seal, the second, I heard the, the second living one saying, you come. And he came out another horse red, and the one sitting upon him, it was given to him to take the peace from out of the earth. And so the one, another, they were slaughtered. And she was given to him a sword, great. Okay, just for a moment for the text, because it almost, for anybody that might be reviewing this at a later date, um, you can stop moving. <laughs> um, the she was given to him a sword. The she and sword are uh feminine in the in the Greek and so it would be a sword was given to him a great sword um just understand it but sometimes the the nouns the, the pronouns because the pronouns are all given for every, with every verb uh that's part of the parsing that's above the the actual text if you have the text itself, uh, it would not be quite so confusing. But the she is a sword in this per in this uh, case. All right, let's go on. All right, um, buddy, you want to take that one thirty three? The rider of the white horse uh, carries a bow. 
is given a crown and certain of victory, goes out conquering. Some features of this mission set it apart from the other three. Its white color, which always denotes affinity with the risen Christ. Um, its uh, emphasis on conquering, which is a word used almost always for Christ and the people of God. And finally, the absence of any mention of negative effects. Also in Zechariah's vision, one team of horses differed from the others. It brought God's spirit to the Lord of the north in order to inspire the exiled Jews to return to Jerusalem, rebuild the temple, and so prepare for the coming of the Lord. Being different from the others, the first horse in Revelation would appear to have an analogous function as a carrier of God's spirit. All the evidence points to this horse and its rider symbolizing the invincible force that leads to the establishment of the messianic kingdom amongst men. Since this comes about through the proclamation of the gospel, there is an evident relation between the mission of the white horse and that of disciples of Jesus. So important is the mission of evangelization that the end of this age will not come before the gospel of the kingdom has been proclaimed throughout the whole inhabited earth. Or in other words, until the white horse has passed throughout the world. There is also an evident resemblance between the role of the white horse and that of the four living creatures. The white horse and its riders represent the force that leads it to acknowledgement of and submission to the sovereignty of God over his creation. Shall I continue? Yes. The next three horses all represent forces which have destructive effects on human life and well-being. Not only do they recall the messianic woes that will precede the second coming in the synoptic apocalypses, but they also evoke the prophetic warnings addressed to the people of Israel of the consequences of failing to keep their covenant with God and observe his commandments. Okay. In the expansions of Exodus 20 in the tar Targums Neophyti and Pseudo Jonathan, the same terrible chastisements are anticipated for those who break the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth of the Ten Commandments given to Moses at Mount Sinai. In this context, the three horses represent the results of rejecting the sovereignty of God. They reveal the anger of God from heaven to those who refuse to be conquered by the love of God in Christ, the white horse. All the apparent evils of the next three horses are, in fact, heavenly chastisements, recalling humankind back to their creator and redeemer. 135. In this passage, the rider of the red horse takes away peace and brings violence and murder. The red color of the horse is symbolical of bloodshed. But the rider's sword, uh, 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 Mixa, 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 is that right? Mixa, Mixa, is, is not so much a weapon of, of war, uh, Rumfaya, uh, yeah, Rumfaya, uh, of reference here. There appears to be social strife, domestic murder, and ideological conflict rather than open warfare. Okay. And when he opened the seal, the third, I heard the third living one saying, you come. And I saw, and you yourself behold, a horse black, and the one sitting upon him having a balance scale in the hand of him and i heard a voice in the midst of the four living ones saying a cornex of wheat or grain for a denarius and three conexes of barley for a denarius and the wine and the oil not you should hurt or harm so the balance scale it was used for the to weigh the denarius. Now the denarius is is a coin for a day's wage. Okay, um, 
and it'll be explained in the footnotes here in a minute, but uh, the balance scales uh, seen by most commentators is uh, a way of indicating that there's a imbalance in the economy of this, such as in a famine. Um, and that'll be explained here in a minute. So, uh, buddy, take it for just two more. Okay. The color of this horse black suggests it represents injustice, oppression, and misery. This is further defined by the yoke, uh, so, so, um, yeah, Zigos, in the hand of its rider, symbolizing servitude and exploitation. Perhaps uh, there is no need here to consider the yoke as a pair of scales, as many have done. Interpreting the scales and what in immediately follows as uh, famine related. Literally, 7, 137, literally, a conix of wheat for a denarius and three conixes of barley for a denarius. The conix is a volume equivalent to about one liter, and the denarius was a Roman silver coin equal in value to a day's wage for hired laborers. Uh, the voice is that of one of the four living creatures giving instructions to the rider of the black horse may again be indicating the close hierarchical, hier hierarchical connection between the four living creatures in heaven and the four horsemen uh, setting out on their global mission. The instruction uh, envisages a situation in which staple foods such as wheat and barley are selling for unjustly high prices, while more luxury items such as oil and wine are affordable. People must work long and hard to pay for the essentials of life. But their labor is alleviated by the enjoyment of a few luxuries, the wine and the oil. The situation could only be one of servitude and economic exploitation. Okay. Oh, mixed with a few inexpensive and transient pleasures as it could as it as could it or it could indicate scarcity because of war or famine or both okay and he opened the seal the fourth and i heard a voice of the fourth living one saying you come and i saw and you yourself behold a pale horse and the one sitting upon him Name to him the death and the Hades he will follow behind with him. And she was given to them authority over a fourth of the earth to destroy, kill with a sword and with famine and with death or plague and by the wild animals of the earth. Okay, buddy, uh, not buddy, um, Robert, do you want to take the footnotes for a little bit? Uh, 138? Yep. 138. <clears throat> the last source is pale green, the color of failing health of life. To emphasize the point, the writer's name is death. Like the other, unlike the other horsemen, he has no instrument, but instead, as the companion whose name is Hades. These two are mentioned elsewhere in the text as the abodes in the netherworld where the dead who fail to enter heaven await the final judgment and from, and from which only the risen Christ has the power to free. In Christian theology, they correspond to the theory of purgatory and hell for Roman Catholics, while in the Jewish tradition, they represent the two parts of Sheol, one for the righteous and the other for sinners, that are separated by an unbridgeable gulf. Here, though, they are described as the personification of these post-mortem abodes. These personifications of death and Hades have the power to kill up to kill up to a quarter of the world's inhabitants through war, represented by the battle sword, famine, disease, and by wild animals. These four forms of death correspond to the four acts of judgment that will afflict those who have gone astray. 
Okay, that, that word purgatory comes up again. Yeah. Um, that came up because that's uh, what the mid, uh, after about three, 300 to 400 AD, uh, the, the explanation by the, uh, the Roman Catholicism, which was, uh, you know, the rulers of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, with Constantine up to the, well, into the middle of the Middle Ages, uh, that was a place uh, that you were in until you had done enough good works to be able to go to heaven. That's a that was something that was you know man created. It's uh, uh, trying to find a a way uh, to give comfort. Actually, I believe if you want to use a positive side of this for the, the Roman Church to uh, for a hope that that loved ones who uh, you know died uh, in childbirth and and uh, and the like what what do you say about them where do they go you know um, uh, how does a merciful God take care of this and so man tried to to explain away uh, what the effect of death is on uh, on people uh, that uh, have survived or continue to go on, and uh, it it's, it it has no basis in Scripture itself, not in the not in the canonical scriptures, in the uh, other writings the pseudepigrapha and other writings um it is just something that is suggested but that they're trying to deal with and cope with the idea of death um one of the things i would point out to you here is that the this fourth horse and death uh, accompanying um, they're also uh, con or not consumed, but they're they're also uh, put in the lake of fire. So uh, something that we need to think about, and I'm I'm trying to work that through right now. But it it is that they, uh, the, you know, in the end, there is no more death. Uh, there is no more need for uh, um, a place for holding dead people. They're either going to be in heaven or they're going to be in the lake of fire. So, yeah, that's what we're looking at there. I don't, I don't take a lot of comfort out of that. <laughs> When they use that word, <laughs> well, here's the, here's the thing: the Book of Revelation, remember, is written for to give comfort and encouragement to the Christian. It does not give comfort to those who do not believe. It condemns them. Exactly. Yeah, uh, and I understand that, but that's see, that's the two sides. Of God, He says what is, and He also says, you know, it's kind of like law and gospel. This is what is right, and this is the, this is the other side of that. This is a punishment if you do what's wrong. You know, you should fear and love God so that. Uh, that's to respect and love God and fear His wrath. Okay, so let's go on now with uh, six, well, six, nine. And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of the ones having been slaughtered on account of the word of the God. And because of the witness of the Lamb, 
one they have they were having and they cried out with a voice great saying until when the master the holy one and true not you decide and you avenge the blood of us okay from out of the ones dwelling of the ones upon the earth all right now for because we have so many in our bible study it hasn't been ever before uh, dennis's brother um when we're looking at this uh, these this translation is a direct translation uh underneath the greek text and the greek text tells you where this all fits together uh, as far as where it's, what is subject, what is object, and the like. And the, the verbs are parsed according to what they are. So uh, dwelling, the ones dwelling of the ones upon the earth, the one dwelling would be, uh, that dwelling is a participle. That's because the Greek is a participle. If it's um, present tense, you decide, for an example, um, that's what that's what the verb is, is present tense, and is a first or second person singular. And all the capitals that you see indicate God. So I uh, all the um, pronouns and the like, uh, re even reflexive pronouns. I have capitalized so that in the, the reading of it, we understand who, who, we're, who we're reading about and make the, the translation a little easier for the person. Okay, so uh, you want to continue then? You want me to continue? Yes. The opening of the fifth seal reveals the souls of the martyrs under the altar in heaven described subsequently in the text as the golden altar altar before the throne on which the incense is offered. Their position under the altar evokes the part of the daily morning service in the second temple when the fully prepared members of the daily whole offering or tam tamid sacrifice were taken to the lower part of the ramp of the outer altar to wait their elevation Unto its, unto its flaming heart. Their consumption in the fire was their presentation to God. Since the Tamid sacrifice has already been identified with Christ the Lamb, the analogy here between the souls of the martyrs and the members of the sacrifice clearly implies the identification of the martyrs with the Lamb. Identification that recalls the doctrine of the church as the body of Christ. Here in the manner of the martyrs, the church is being prepared for her presentation before God. The martyrs were slain because of the word of God and the witness that they held. There's a slight variation of the usual formula, word of God and word of God and witness of Jesus. Although the witness which they held would be for narrowly the witness of Jesus, transmitted to the church by St. John. In the text, subject of the genitive, it appears to refer more generally to the witness given by the martyrs to Jesus, object of the genitive. There is, to say the least, a deliberate ambiguity here so that both meanings are equally acceptable. Martyrs ask how long they must wait until God's vindication of the cause for which they have lost their lives. Since their longing for justice will not be satisfied until the time of final judgment, the martyrs show that they are impatiently waiting for this event. The impatience for divine judgment is very revealing. It suggests that the present heaven, the first heaven, does not 
entirely satisfy their internal long, longings. They are actually directed toward the eternal state on God's final judgment, which the text calls the new heavens and new earth. The inhabitants of the earth is a contemporary designation for those who are attached to the world and its idols and are rebellious or hostile to God. Precisely the same expression, the similar significance, is found 18 times in the parables of Enoch. Enoch. Let's remember that Enoch is a non canonical book, and we'll find that this um, commentary uh, often refers and has these um, non canonical references, um, which should mean to us that they may be fine, uh, but they are not something to build a doctrine or a belief on. Uh, because they're not the inspired word. Okay. And it was given to them, each one a robe, white. And it was said to them, so that they themselves will rest, yet a time a little, until they have been completed, also the ones fellow serve slaves of them and the brothers of them the ones being about to be killed as also they one more time Robert the white robe was a type of ceremonial dress worn by people of high society post-mortem gift post-mortem if the white robes to these martyrs distinguishes them from the martyrs who already possess white robes when they are killed later in the Great Tribulation. Their, their martyr, martyrdom allows them to wash and bleach their robes in the blood of the Lamb. After being washed and bleached by passing through the Great Tribulation, the robes of the innumerable host of martyrs will be clean and bright, which is the description given to the fine linen of the bride, thus identifying the innumerable hosts of martyrs with the bride of the lamb and their robes with, their, with her fine linen. Finally, we are told that the fine linen of the bride represents the righteous works of the saints. All right, now just a minute there. Let me... I think I take issue with that on that point, but let me get 19.8. Okay, just con uh, let's just continue. Go ahead. The Old Testament church and Mark martyrs was saved by their faith, worked by God's spirit, trusting in the Messiah Savior to come, Jesus Christ. Here is a clear case of, of where going beyond the text results in false teaching. Can, okay, can, you, say, can you read the lined out portion so that they know what we're talking about? <laughs> so, so in, in all cases, starting there, yeah. Okay. No, no, up above. Some Oh. Some might some might say the implication therefore is that unlike the martyrs in seven fourteen, the martyrs under the altar in six eleven had not been able to perform the righteous deeds necessary to make their own robes. This identifies them not only with the martyrs of the old testament whose deeds had not been rendered righteous by faith in Christ but also with those early Christian martyrs who were killed for the faith so soon after conversion that they had no time to perform righteous deeds. In all cases, the granting of white robes for these martyrs does not justify or support the Roman Church's doctrine of indulgences or salvation by works 
by which the saints were supposed to be able to produce fine linen robes not only for themselves, but also for those who are identified with the bride. And for okay, now, reason, you, now you can read my comments in the, in the yellow. In the yellow? I don't have that. Uh -huh. oh, okay. You have the line out, though, right? And then yeah. after that, here is a clear case we're going beyond yeah. the text results in false teaching. We can only say that and teach what scripture says, not one deduction more, not one step. The okay. What's happened here is that uh, first of all, the Old Testament the Old Testament believers that would be obviously include the Old Testament martyrs, were looking forward to the Messiah for their forgiveness. They were looking for, and Simeon uh, is a good example of that, that he was looking for Christ and then says he's ready to go to be with the Lord. Um, in our note to menace. So, as we look at this uh, this thing here, that he's gone one step. He's assumed something and gone too far. Um, for the, the Old Testament, look to Christ. If you look at it as on a timeline or a, you know a, a line across the page, Old Testament, and put New Testament, and put Jesus in the middle. As the Old Testament looked for Christ, the Messiah, for their salvation, so we look back on that timeline to Christ. We have more given to us, so we have an advantage, I believe, in that respect of understanding who Jesus is. But it requires us to look back just as it required for them to look forward. So you can't say that they they um, had no no um, they didn't have faith in Christ. They had faith in the Messiah. They had faith in God, and they trusted His word that He would give them a Savior. So we have somebody like Job who says, "Though He slay me, yet will I trust Him." Trust is faith in action. All right. Um, Well, let's go to 144 then. And Robert, I'll give you another shot. All right. Okay. It's got some more kind of marked off on it, but go ahead. Okay. The theme, the theme of the rest of the martyrs here and of the saints in 1413 resonates with the creator's rest on the seven day of creation, the Sabbath, and indicates how the eternal law concerning the Sabbath was fulfilled in the New Testament. It was not abrogated. Jesus Christ is the Christian Sabbath. He is our rest. We rest in him. The Sabbath is part of the Ten Commandments, so it is part of the covenant of God with Israel, but it is but it does not from the basis of the covenant as stated following. Just as the Sabbath forms the basis of the covenant between God and Israel, so also the Sabbath Rest in heaven continues to be an important part of the new and eternal covenant established in Jesus Christ. The theme of the Sabbath rest in heaven underlies the description of the 1,000 year reign of Christ, which with his saints later in the text. We need to let the commentator develop his logic. This is the theme and theory so far that is given to lead us somewhere. The opening of the fifth seal brings us up to only a short time before the final expression, divine justice. Taking this to be a eschatological event occurring near or at the end of, the, of history, we can infer that the activities of the four horsemen described following the opening of the four, first four seals represent a summary of the entire historical pro process 
of the ascension of Christ in a short time before the divine judgment. Most? Most? Okay. Um, let's give you a break. Diane, okay. you want to take it from there? 146. Most modern translations have something like until the number would be complete before both of their fellow servants and their brothers and sisters. However, the word number does not appear in any of the Greek manuscripts and its inclusive inclusion perversely implies that the predetermined number of Christ's witness would most perish before the judgment of God will be revealed. Such a belief could encourage Christians to hasten the end by provoking their own martyrdom, leading to the trivialization of this supreme act. Literally translated, the martyrs under the altar must wait until also their fellow servants and their brothers have been filled. This can either be understood simply as perfected by martyrdom in this case, or as a subtle allusion to priestly consecration since to fill the hand. What is all what is this all about? It is literally translation of the ancient Hebrew expression of the consecration of the priest. The etymology is obscure. Furthermore, this Hebrew expression is translated literally in the Greek version of the Old Testament, using the same verb or its cognate form. In this context, then, the use of the Greek verb that means to fill not only evokes the priestly consecration, but also suggests an act of consecration that involves the whole soul and not just the hand. It is not stated in the text precisely what fills the soul of these martyrs, but it seems to be the vision of the throne itself after their martyrdom that entirely fills their soul and so completes their consecration. It would have to be the vision of Christ as Savior, Lamb of God and Lord, to make this vision make sense and appears to be what St. Stephen is seeing or at least describing. And I okay. Let's just stop there for a minute. Um, okay. Anybody have a comment on what we just read? What was just read? I I, uh, I have a question going back a little bit there. All right. The early there was a school of thought in the early church that Christian martyrs who did not we did not have lived long enough to perform good works, were not saved. Is that what they're saying? I don't think that's true. Back that off a little bit to what, uh, can you tell me what verse you're at for this? Let me, let me see if I can find it. Like, I don't. I don't think I can find it, but okay. Part of part of this is um, a, a theological uh, belief. Uh, remember, we work righteousness is just built into Judaism. Period, and it it creeps back into Christianity uh, because the Christian leaders are are. Uh, are trying to make their congregation holy. All right. How do I tell that somebody is a believer? Well, by their by their actions, by their good works, you will know them. All right. But the good works don't make them Christians uh, unless in doing their good works they develop faith uh, for some reason in the work that they're doing. But faith is about trust in God and his word and his savior. And uh, your righteousness comes from what Christ has done for you. And 
giving you his Holy Spirit so that you believe and trust in him. Okay, I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ nor come to him. That, that is the, our theological position. And it's based on what the scriptures say. Uh, again, we're at faith alone, scripture alone, Christ alone. His word. So, this idea of the martyrdom and the different things that uh, play into it, uh, the martyrs giving their, their life and their witness there has to be a trust in in uh, in Christ at that point. So, and so to say that they didn't do enough, uh, that pulls this whole idea of purgatory back into the picture. And it is advantageous or was advantageous to the church, and I think it still is, uh, because it helps fund them, Okay. But now I'm talking about the church on earth. I'm not talking about the church, true church universal. Um, you say, well, how can you be it? Because we're a mixed group. The universal Christian church is the church that believes in Jesus Christ as, as being true God and true man who died for you and who has, through his merits, has made it possible for you to have your sins removed and put on him and his righteousness put on you. So the robe of righteousness that wraps you in, in protection uh, is the work that he did for you. And the Holy Spirit that's been given to you so that you will continue to believe and trust in him and were called originally by him you see God in this whole thing saving you, not you saving yourself through your works. Your works are an expression of your love back to God for what he has done for you, and he moves you to do them. And that's what makes them acceptable in his sight. Not your human effort, but that doesn't dissuade your, uh, your effort. But we should know and know that it's Christ. And because he loved us and did those things, it generates a love within us. So um, that whole thing about uh, martyrs not having done enough, uh, if they're under the altar in heaven, they did plenty. Okay? Yeah. Any, yes, sir. Uh, I hope I answered the question. A little bit, yeah. Okay. Um, is there any other? Buddy, have you got any comment on this last section we just did? No, no. I was kind of fixated on that uh, question and comment about purgatory that uh, Dave raised a while ago, but we kind of put that off. I, I don't want to take that up right at this point. Okay. All right. Well, it seems it seems like the, uh, there was some liberties taken, you know, I don't know, before or after this time, that uh, that's where I run into a little bit of an issue with some of that. Well, I'm just going to summarize it real quickly. My, my teacher, Lydia Lazar, has been oh. trying to spend the better part of a lifetime kind of questioning and attacking the notion of purgatory as it has crept into the Eastern Orthodox Church, where it really has no place. And a short time ago, I was surprised that uh, he actually commented to me that Pope John, John Paul had referred to it as one at one point in his life as a theory, right? So I don't know that, uh, that you know, that would suggest it's actually not a dogma of the uh, Roman Catholic Church, but in areas where the Eastern Orthodox faith is prominent, namely the Middle East, Romania, uh, Balkan Greece, Bulgaria, uh, Albania, places like this, there's an awful lot of superstition uh, that goes on that has nothing to do with either scriptural teachings or even sacred tradition 
on the afterlife, nothing to do with it. That doesn't stop people from believing in it. And there are people who are praying for their uh, departed loved ones in the belief that uh, they are um, uh, they are saving them from demons who are waiting to grab their souls at their at their death and challenge them about their their sins and uh, misdeeds in this world. And so Lika Lazar spent a long time uh, challenging that. But what what it comes down to is uh, actually uh, incredible Eastern Orthodox writings that, that take this on. First of all, Orthodox theology is apophatic, which is to say we know what we don't know. So the, the writers would generally say there's an awful lot we don't know about the afterlife. And there's actually very precious little in scripture or tradition to inform us about the afterlife. Nevertheless, I'm going to go on for about six or 700 pages writing about the afterlife. So there's a lot of this that goes on both in the, uh, among the, the uninformed laity and the very informed uh, theologians. Well, I think one part of that, okay, there, there are two key points that I think are worth considering. One is that uh, there's the notion that in the afterlife, although one may not be expiating one's sins on earth, one may make some spiritual progress and headway by living in eternally in the presence of the living God. So in the afterlife, we may, you know, enjoy some spiritual improvement. It would be hard not to. Uh, secondly, uh, where is I going to go with that second comment? Uh, yeah, there's just an awful lot that we don't know. And, uh, uh, the, oh, yeah, yeah the, the notion of the, of the fire uh, referred to in Revelation. There's a lot of writing recently on that, the river of fire, the lake of fire. And the analogy that's usually used is that uh, fire can be a good thing or it can be a bad thing. Light, intense light can be a good thing or it can blind us and radiate us and blow us up. So one spiritual disposition uh, really has a lot to do with how one, whether one is comfortable or uncomfortable with this fire. Is this fire uh, a warming thing or is this fire going to burn one up? So that one's spiritual disposition actually does begin to play a part in one's, uh, uh, one's spiritual afterlife and uh, but, you know, again, as the great Oswald Chambers said, who was a you know, hard-headed Protestant, um, being able to explain the uh, doctrine of redemption has nothing to do with salvation. <laughs> so there you have it. There you go. I, I can affirm that <clears throat> as somebody who went to parochial school for eight years, first eight years, this was before John Paul II, and purgatory was definitely... Not a theory, but firm doctrine. <laughs> well, um, and, and it was a firm to, uh, doctrine back there um, at Luther's time and in De Tetzel's sale of <clears throat> indulgences, where he said that with a coin dropped into the box, another soul flies to heaven. It, it was an economic dem uh, advantage. It... Uh, it got its big kick start, uh, or at least uh, its build up to strength in the the Crusades, uh, when it originally was you know, the indulgences was to pay for somebody else to go to battle for you in the Crusades, and of course that person was assured of of eternal life because he was fighting for God and. The person supporting him was assured of eternal life because he was sending him off. And that's how indulgences got uh, started. And it was uh, uh, certainly a financial boon to the, to the Catholic Church. And uh, they're, they sell indulgences even to this day. So, yeah, yeah purgatory, I think, is still a, a solid doctrine. Even though, now, when John Paul's called it a, a theory, you see where he has, uh, he himself, the leader of his church, 
does not see it as uh, as a fact. So, I mean, I can't speak much more on it because I don't know that much more about Catholicism. I have enough trouble just working on being a Christian Protestant. <laughs> so, with that, we're just about out of time. So, we'll pick this back up with Revelation 6, 12. Uh, thank you all for your uh, uh, contributions today and understanding the, the text and the uh, discussion about uh, the afterlife. Uh, this Sunday coming up is uh, we will be celebrating uh, uh, All, Saints. All Saints Day, even though All Saints Day is normally the first November 1st, we're going to be on November 3rd. We are still celebrating uh, All Saints Day. And uh, so I'm busy working in that area right now, trying to put a sermon together and understand more about that. I know that the afterlife will, will certainly be wonderful, and uh, it's struggling to get there, uh, which... Uh, becomes uh, the subject of our, our life. So let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, you have given us your word to trust. You have given us your apostles, prophets, and martyrs to witness to us that your word is true, that salvation is assured through Jesus Christ, our Lord. <clears throat> We ask your blessing on this day upon us and our loved ones. And may your word work <laughs> in our hearts and minds that we continue to be faithful unto death that we might have the crown of life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>